you see these things on TV, America's Most Wanted, he's the kingpin and he's the, the drug lord or the drug leader and that's what I was seen as up here. And I got arrested and they put it on the front page of the paper and from where I'm from, where I'm from it wouldn't have been as big a deal. But up here, you know, that's, that's exactly what I was. I was supplying a lot of the drugs up here. A lot of the cocaine was coming from me. You have to first stop and, and think to yourself more than anything. You know, you could talk to people, but you got to really stop and think of the things that you're doing and all the other things that you were thinking you'd be doing 10 years ago. I mean, when I was 11, 12, even 15, I thought I was going to D1, Division I lacrosse school and I was going to be playing lacrosse. And that was it. And that's all I wanted to do was play lacrosse, play lacrosse. Well, I was a, a senior in high school. I was uh, captain of my lacrosse team in 10th grade varsity lacrosse. I was the only 10th grader in Mass Beagle history to be varsity captain as a 10th grade. Um, Come senior year, I started hanging out with the wrong kids, smoking a lot of marijuana. My father knew from day one, Keith, I don't like you hanging out with these kids. They're not a good influence on you. Yeah, Dad, look at me now. Look where it got me. Going to prison, 21 years old and going to prison. You see kids doing certain things on weekends, going to the city in limousines and you know, partying up, and, and, and you want it, you know, you want, you want that. You know, here I am, always did good in school, always, you know, straight and narrow, and played lacrosse, and did the right thing, and, you know, you want a little taste of that action, you want a little, you want to have a little fun like that. And uh, you start hanging out with the wrong kids, and, you know, I, I shouldn't blame them, because, you know, I got right into it, and I fell into it, and doing a lot of drugs, and mood swings started happening, fighting with the family. Don't think about it when you're doing it. You just, you, uh, you know, I'll uh, fight with my dad. I'll go out and smoke a joint. You know, go out and smoke a blunt. Who cares? And you sit there and you're high and you don't even think about it. It's out of your mind. And you come home and it's staring you right in the face again. So what do you do? You leave. You know, my parents and I went like this to like this. You know, you say, people say, yeah, just smoke a marijuana, just smoke a marijuana. Yeah, just smoke a marijuana, but. Just smoking that marijuana made me stay away from my family. Not want to be with them, I want to be out with my friends getting high. Now, you know, ah, keep going to go this, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do this, you know, I'm going to go out and do this, but I'm really going out and getting high. And you just get into that lifestyle and then you start having attitudes. And my coach and I had uh, some serious uh, personality conflicts. And uh, I quit the team my senior year. You know, I was too good for him, I thought, you know, who's he to tell me that I don't know how to do this? And so, to hell with him, I said. And I quit. I like having fun. I like having fun. And, you know, not thinking, I, I'm impatient. I'm impatient. I knew it would have came sooner or later. But, hey, I'm... 17, what'd you do? I went to the city last night. I went to, you know, I went to the limelight. What'd you do, you know? People from home said, Keith Plattsburgh, where is that? It's up in the sticks. I said, far from home. It's far from home. Um, you know, eastern Long Island would have been far from home, but get me out of here, you know? And uh, I come from Long Island. It's hustle and bustle. to the New York minute, like they say, you know, we live a fast life. And I came up here, and it was ha, mountains and rivers, and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it. Mountain biking, snowboarding, and uh, more marijuana than you could possibly know what to do with. As soon as I came up, that's how I met half of my friends. You know, you, you, you going out smoking? Oh, yeah, me too. Before you know it, there's 20 just going through the, walking through the woods or finding a spot, you know, where you have something in common, you have a bond. You know, some of these kids, you know, that's the only time they get high that week. Me, you know, getting high after class, you know, 
I found an excuse. If I fail the test, go get high. If I ace the test, go get high. It's raining out, do nothing, we'll get high. It's beautiful out, we'll go get high. And that's the way it worked. You know, it was making an, an excuse and, and for everything, you know, whatever it was. I had a, had a reason to do it, you know. And it, I wasn't like uh, thinking, I'm thinking it's just marijuana, I'm just smoking weed. It doesn't control me, it doesn't control me, I could stop when I want. I can honestly say, three and a half years I was in Plattsburgh State, the most I ever didn't smoke was maybe two weeks. And the most you did not smoke, right. the longest period you did not smoke. And that was, uh, yeah, freshman year, sophomore year, no, freshman year, I'm sorry, for two weeks. And the thought never even crossed my mind again after that to even stop. And I don't think I've ever went a day where I didn't smoke. You know, all right, I got to study, a test to study for. All right, we'll just, we'll get high this morning or this afternoon, and then I'll study tonight. You get ripped in the afternoon, your mind is in a cloud, and you are not. You may study, you may read those pages, but you're not remembering anything. You know, thank the Lord, I was, I was, I was kind of bright growing up. I always did well in school, and I, and I didn't have to really study and study and study. So all I would have to do is go to class and absorb that in, and I would learn enough from the class and sitting in the classroom and the lectures to pass my tests. Um, I knew a lot of kids that weren't blessed with that gift. And I lost a lot of friends in Plattsburgh. They'd go home with point twos or one point ohs, you know, and uh, they go. off they go. Because they were getting high all day, drinking all night, you know, um, not going to classes, coming home at six in the morning, hammered, and sleeping through the test. I can a number of friends, they'd have a final at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday. They'd go down to chug a mug on a Wednesday night. They wouldn't make it to class. And I'd say, you know, I mean, I'd always made it to a final, granted, but did I know what was on the test? Maybe, maybe not. Most likely, no. You know. Well, you smoke six times a day, and we would smoke what you call a blunt. You take a cigar, you empty it. You roll it up, you roll about an eighth of weed in there. That can be for anywhere from 25 to 40 to 50, 60 dollars. Um, smoking those a couple times a day. And then if some people didn't want to smoke, you'd always find someone who did. Someone didn't have money. All right, you know, I got money. Before you know it, you don't have any more money. Um, so you start smell, s selling a little pot. You know, you find someone, you sell a little pot. But, uh, money's all right, but you got no money to live, you know. And you don't, you don't, you smoke all your profit. You don't, you know, even if you smoke more than your profit. And then, um, you know, cocaine. Everyone knows, you hear cocaine, oh, you know, he sells cocaine, he's got money, he's got money. You know, so uh, selling cocaine, I had more marijuana than, you know, as much as I wanted, it was there. I could smoke all day and not even think twice about where am I going to get a bag from. You know, and you wind up getting so involved in a world of drugs and a world like to know, to think that people went to college and didn't do what I was doing. I was like, yeah, well, you know, they're not living. They're not living. You know, I'm selling coke, making money, living the good life, you know, eating steak, filet mignon for dinner and getting high all night and not even studying, you know. And doing all right, you know. I thought I'm on top of the world, you know. Because um, that's what you think. But when you look back at it, it's you weren't anything. You were an idiot who couldn't wait and be patient to do good, do well in school, do good and get a job, and then have the money and live an honest life. My mother always said, make it honestly. You can make as much money as you want as long as you make it honestly. She would say that to me while I was doing this, and I would say, yeah, Mom, I know, I know. And that's what's the, the hardest part of it all is you live in two lives. You selling, I'm selling drugs at school, and I'm going home, and I'm trying to be with my family. And, you know, they don't have a clue what I'm doing. Then when you get more and more into it, you know, and you're bringing up 
you're selling more drugs at school. When you're at school, you don't think people think of you as a drug dealer. These are your friends. But you look back and you're like, you know, oh, they, they saw me driving this and they saw me wearing these clothes. You know, they definitely looked at me like a drug dealer. Where, where I come from, it's, you know, the guy selling crack on the corner or slinging to little kids. You know, that's what you always hear is growing up is, you know, they're selling to push into little kids, they're pushing to little kids, the drug dealers, they sell to little kids, and that's their main target is to get kids hooked. I was just giving it to my friends. Numerous ounces of cocaine from Long Island to Plattsburgh. And just Long Island to Plattsburgh. Right. Passing it off to my friends and just thinking I'm helping them out too. We're all helping each other out. If I need something, they got me. If I need, they want something, there it is. When I first started selling, um, I was smell, selling small quantities. What's a small quantity? A gram, an eight ball, 3.5 grams. Um, people come knocking on your door at 5 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, saying yeah. they ran out, Keith. You know, I'm sleeping. I'm trying to sleep here. You know, I got to get up for class the next morning. Class and me sleeping is the last thing on their mind. The only thing they're thinking is, get this kid up. I mean, they would hike across campus at 5 in the morning, knock on my door, and say, Keith, you know, Keith, Keith, Keith. I had kids leave me social security cards, credit cards, you know, driver's licenses for collateral. You know, it's, and he would sit there and say, wow, this kid can't even control himself to the point where he's giving me a social security card or a credit card. And he didn't think twice about it. You know, he wouldn't think twice about it. If you think I won't get arrested, it's not going to happen to me. You know, I'm too co I'm too precautious. I'm too I'm too smart. I'll never sell to a, to a police officer. Um, but you didn't? no, and I didn't. I didn't. I made sure I didn't. I was very precautious about everything. Um, but you can never be too safe, and everybody always gets caught. My grandmother's been saying that to me since. My arrest, Keith, you always get caught. Everybody always gets caught. Um, I thought about, you know, yeah, yeah, what it would do in my family. But then it's just a thought in your mind. You can't really imagine it. You can't really imagine what it will actually do. My plan was that the, the batch that I got caught with was supposed to be my last time selling. And then I was going to hand the business over to someone who I'd known for a very long time. And uh, that was going to be it. You know, I said, I'm going to get a nice little piece of money together, and that's it. I'm going to be done. I'm going to finish up school, and I'm going to go ahead and live. You can't sleep at night half the time. You're thinking, you know, I'm looking out my windows. Um, you get paranoid. You really do. You know, you, I'm driving this stuff up from, from Long Island six hours. My heart's coming through my chest. If a trooper comes anywhere near me, I want to jump out the window, but you just try and stay calm, and he drives by you. But you, you, your heart's coming out of your chest, you know. And you go home, and I would go home. My grandfather was very ill when I was uh, when I was arrested. And you would go home, and I'd see him, and I felt like a, that time I felt like a real piece of garbage because I'm going home to see my grandfather, and that's really why I was going home. But I'm home. I'm going to pick something up while I'm home. I'm driving six hours. I might as well get something. You know? So that's what you do. With an older brother and a younger brother. And a younger brother, yes. I got the best of both worlds. And I let them both down from what I did. They had no idea. My little brother, at first, he couldn't even hold his head high in school because people knew. I mean, the internet gets word around quickly. Those aren't the things. You, you know, you want him to be thinking of you as it's a, this drug dealer that lived a double life and lied to him and told him he was doing one thing when he was out doing another thing. And my older brother, the same thing, you know. Why are you coming home this weekend? Oh, I'm coming home for, you know, to do this. Or I'm coming home to see Pop. Or really, I'm coming home to, you know, grab some cocaine. I was very, very close with my grandfather. Um, he's an amazing, amazing man. Um, and just sit there and look at him in a, in a, in a hospital bed with a 
trach in his throat, not being able to talk, and he doesn't know what's going on. And you just think, I'm not going to get caught. I'll just get this money, and it'll all be past me, and he'll never know, and no one will ever know, and I'll be all right. Everything will be all right. And I got arrested. And my main concern when I got arrested, get out of here and go see Pop before he passes. Be with him before he passes. And he died. He died. Um, I was out for two months, and he died. Now he does. Now that he's in heaven, he knows. But he forgives me, I know he does, because that's how he is. Well, he loves you. Yeah. You know, what would he have thought? Oh, God, I couldn't even, I can't even fathom the thought. He was such a hardworking, by the book man. Knights of Columbus, Grand Knight, you know, um, you name it, everybody knew. Aldo, Aldo, Aldo. What a man, what a man, you know. And he always said I was going to be like him. I have a lot of his traits. But now I don't even want to be compared to him. I'm not even a fraction of what the man he was, you know. The last words he, I ever heard him spoke. Speak, I'm sorry, was my cousin's wedding in September. And he was slowly, slowly, couldn't walk. And he said, uh, I walked into a room and he looked up and he said, you have to watch out for him. Because he knew, you know, I was out, you know, I could get into things and, you know, I was, I was you know, 18, 17, 18, working in Manhattan, working on Broadway, you know downtown look at me in my suits and you know he knew he said this kid's gonna he's gonna be something you know and, yeah I'm gonna be something you know? so now I I got a, a roaring fire to get out and to make it successfully and honestly and uh, do it for him you know My father's a retired police officer, um, 28 years. He, like, he, it's very hard for him. He's not one to get emotional. He's not one to show his feelings. Um, keeping it in, a lot of it. From my, what I heard, he didn't really break out of his shell until uh, the day I got sentenced and he met with the counselor that we'd been seeing. And he, uh, he broke down. And, uh, it's probably a good thing. Yeah. What's that feel like, knowing that your dad has broke down? Thank you. Yeah. What's it feel like? Uh, It's a feeling you can't describe. You, you wake up every day. The past six months until I was sentenced, you wake up every day thinking, what did I do to my family? We were happy. We were, everything was perfect. You know, but I'm sorry. You just, um, it, it's something you try not to think about because when you do it, you, you want to put a bullet in your head, you know? But you get through it like, like I did, and you deal with it. And my parents were there for me. They didn't push me away. They didn't forget about me. And that's why I'm still here, because without them, without the Lord, I, I couldn't tell you if I'd be here or not. I don't know. I got arrested, and my father drove up here at 2 o'clock in the morning. To, you know, to, he wanted to rip my head off, but he stood by me, because he's family. And that's what they do. Um, I've lost, I've raised a puppy since he was five weeks old. I'm his father. I'm all he knows. I lost him. My girlfriend, I lost her. My mom, she's ashamed to show a face in the neighborhood. She's 
ashamed to talk about me in front of my friends. The look on my mother's face when I first, I mean, I, when I got out on bail, I couldn't look at my mother for a week. Um, and then, uh, thanks. I was too ashamed. I knew. I couldn't even look at her. I couldn't even look at her. First day I saw her was Thanksgiving. And we embraced, and she asked why. I had no answer. Before you blessed me with the three to life sentence, um, we couldn't talk about it. She couldn't, she couldn't handle it. Um, like my father said, 192 Sundays in four years. He counted them. That's when he would visit. But, um, no, my mother, once I found out that I was going to be eligible for shock, then she talked because she was relieved. Her son was going to be home again. You know? But what it did to my family is just, well, I'm, you know, look at me. You know, I sit in a cell all night, you know, by myself, hearing people yell, fights breaking out. I don't, I don't cry, you know. I'm, that's me. I'm tough. But when I hurt my family, I mean, when I first got arrested, I didn't cry. I was looking at 15 years, I didn't cry. And uh, once you realize what you did to your family, that's when it hits your heart and it sinks in. And, you realize what you did. I had a job in Manhattan, you know, a, a, a golden road ahead of me, and uh, I screwed it all up. You know, coming over here, we pulled up next to a car at the light, and the people looked over, and they looked right back, and they looked over again, and they whispered to each other, and they're saying, look at this, you know, prisoner. You know, it's, it's not nice to be seen as that. You don't want to, you see it on TV. You'll be watching this video saying, eh, that's just him. That's just him. That won't be me. I watched those videos. I saw those things on TV. That won't be me. I'm not going to get caught. I'm not. I'm just, you know. Well, here I am going to prison. My fear is about state prison. You watch those movies and you about guys getting raped, guys getting stabbed, you know, gang fights, racial fights. And you watch those shows and you think, that's TV. You get into county, you, you, this is a county jail. There's fights every day, you know. People do get stabbed with, you know, just a pen or a pencil, but they do. And then you talk to people who've been to prison, and they tell you how it is. They got slices across their stomach because almost everyone gets cut. And I gotta face it. I gotta face the real, the real world, the real prison life, and uh, fight for my life. Probably. You know, am I ready for that? You're never ready for it, but you have no choice. You know, you have no choice. If someone's gonna come at me with a with a knife or a shank, it, it's something that's gonna happen. I'm sure. My family is everything. Drugs are definitely not anything that you should even be considering. It's, you want to experiment because you're going to be curious. That's understandable. But you don't want to, I mean, I, it's really, if I could take it all back, you know, and you, you, you learn from your mistakes. You'll learn from things you've been through. And you need courage. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and courage to, to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. It's, it's, you can't erase time. You can't go back in time. You got to live in the now. You got to live in the present. And you got to think of the future, where you want to be in the future. Do you want to be, you know, where I am? Or do you want to be working on Wall Street? Working on Wall Street is where you want to be. And if you, 
you're messing with drugs, if you're doing drugs, if you're selling drugs, if you're hanging out with people who sell drugs, you're going to wind up where I am. Because you're not, everybody gets caught. It doesn't matter who you are or how small you are. You will get caught. And if it's not, if it's getting caught selling them, or if you get caught, you get pulled over and you, and you got a, a gram of coke in your car, you're going to jail. And then it's too late to look back and think, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. Because you're there and, you know, that's tough. I want to save any family or any kid from the things that my family and I have gone through. No one deserves the mental anguish. I wouldn't, you don't want to go through it.